Make that applause for everyone. Right? We'll go through applause until everybody's out there closing the marks about 90 minutes from now. I appreciate it. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here tonight. And uh, that was an outstanding way to start with that oath. And a few of us have taken that oath. And I put my hand up in the air and swore to uphold and defend the Constitution as a member of the armed forces, and I take it very seriously. I would die for it. And I tell people throughout this process that politically, I'm willing to die for it. And I think that's important. And I think that needs to be a question that we ask of every candidate running in this race, whether it's congressional or senatorial or at the state level or for president. Because right now we have politicians who don't pay enough attention to that document and that oath and what it actually means and what it stands for. I'm Travis Grantham. I'm a third generation Arizona, a husband and a father. I'm a business owner and I'm a pilot and officer in the Arizona Air National Guard. Three things. We have record debt in this country. $16 trillion in debt. A number that poses a greater threat to our nation and to our ongoing existence than any enemy, foreign or domestic. That means one minute's up? Okay, one thing then. It's an honor to be here tonight. I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks for having me. Sorry about the, my not explaining the color. Wow, what, what that is for is, if you have more than 15 seconds left, it's gonna be green. If you have less than 15 seconds left, it's gonna be yellow. And if, and if that red card comes up, please finish the sentence you're on and stop speaking to respect other people's time. Thank you very much. Jeff Thompson, you're next. Hello, I think I got it there. It's good being home. I've lived in Alatini 31 years, raised my family here. I'm not a politician, I'm a retired businessman. Uh, enter this race, everybody says, why would you come out of retirement to enter this race? And I use a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said that tyranny gets a foothold when people of good conscience remain silent. This is the most important election of my lifetime. I didn't want to sit on the sideline and wait. Uh, when you look at Obamacare and people go around and say we need to repeal Obamacare, it's a little bit misguided because if we don't keep the House, win the Senate, and win the White House, we're stuck with Obamacare. This is a very important election. And it's important that we get the right people back there with the experience in the business world and that understand how to reform health care uh, when we can repeal Obamacare. So thanks so much. Look forward to visiting with you tonight. Thank you. Scared me, so I went back. Wendy Rogers. Good evening. I'm Wendy Rogers, W-E-N-D-Y, R-O-G-E-R-S. I live in this district. I'm a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, pilot, startup business owner. I'm running because I promised my father, retired Lieutenant Colonel Harry L. Rogers III, the day he passed away, February 6th, that I would honor him, honor his legacy as a World War II and Korean War veteran in my run for Congress, and that I would do everything I can to get my country back. And that is why I'm running. My website's wendyrogers.org, and it's an honor to run for office. Thank you. Leah Campos-Shandlebauer. Thank you. My name is Leah Campos-Shandlebauer, and I'm, I'm really happy to be back here again. Many of you have, um, have heard me speak before when I was here a couple, uh, a month or so ago. So I'll just say quickly, um, I recently left a career at the Central Intelligence Agency where I served all over the world as an operations officer. And uh, I, I'm running because I began to hear, uh, coming out of Washington, the same sort of class warfare rhetoric that I had grown accustomed to hearing out of the mouths of tin horn dictators and populists in, in, in countries like Venezuela and in Argentina, and it concerned me, and I think to the recent uh, comments out of the mouth of President Obama about business, uh, and entre business leaders and entrepreneurs uh, only highlights uh, that I made the right decision to do this because I would like to uh, run a campaign centered on the energetic uh, defense of the free enterprise system because I believe that that system and the and the very values this country was founded on are under attack and we need to defend it and that is why I've decided to do this. I, I look forward to meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you. 
Other candidates that were invited tonight include Lisa Borowski, Martin Sepulveda, and Vernon Parker. These three individuals were invited because they responded to our original roundtable query. There are additionally three other candidates in this race, in another party, in the primary. None of those three were invited tonight, not because I would love to get a chance at the pinata, but they did not respond to our original roundtable. We took that as a lack of interest. They are Kirsten Cinema, Andre Cherney, and David Shapiro. The first round, there will be the same question for all of the candidates. Each question will have one minute to respond. <clears throat> there are eight questions, each in a different category. I will read the question, and then I will ask in random order the response. First category, jobs and the economy. The question is, what, if anything, does the federal government have to do with the creation of jobs in the United States? Wendy Rogers. It is not the job of the federal government to create jobs. It is my responsibility as a small business owner to create jobs. I meet a 14 employee payroll in this district. I own Housemaster Home Inspections and it is a tough time right now. I have been a startup business owner for 15 years. My husband, Hal Cunnan, and I are the owners. We own an office building on Rural Road where we have eight tenants. I will do everything in my power to get government out of the way of those of us who are small business owners. And I am proud to say I'm the only one who meets a payroll in this district. And I resent President Obama saying three days ago that it was I, a small business owner, who didn't do it by myself. How would he know? Uh, I'll answer your question. He was off a teleprompter. And you found out what a socialist says when they're off a teleprompter. That was a socialist statement. I agree, it's not the responsibility of the government to create jobs, but it is the responsibility of the government to create the environment for job creation. Right. And I'm going to tell you something, we've got too much regulation in this country, and the regulation is crippling on small business people. There's too many small business people that have money and are on the sidelines, and they're scared to death to expand their business or start new businesses because of regulation. With Obamacare on the horizon, if we don't do what I said earlier, and the people like the Tea Party unite, and just real quick, the Tea Party, you guys are so powerful. No organization has ever influenced politics like you guys, and that's why the liberal left's taking shots at you. Don't back down. We've got to fix our tax system in this country. We need a flat tax. The corporate income tax is 35%. That's too high. I think it's the third highest in the world. And the dividend tax on top of it makes it 50% when you have profits you want to take out of a corporation. Got many more ideas. Go on my website. My red card's up. Great job. Travis Grantham. Well, it's been, it's been answered pretty well so far. And, and years ago, I'd say nothing. But today, what can they do? What can the federal government do? Ultimately is your question. And it's get out of the way. And we've heard it from all of these candidates and that's going to be the standard answer amongst Republicans. I too, as a job creator, as a small business owner, I deal with so much regulation and taxation, it prevents me from hiring two to four additional staff at my business alone because of the excess cost associated with things as simple as washing an airplane. It's insanity, you know? We have an EPA that's in every aspect of our lives in this country. It needs to be completely done away with at the federal level. We have DEQ in the state of Arizona that could easily do that job. The Department of Education, the Department of Energy, these agencies were originally created with the intent of helping create that environment that Jeff spoke about. And now they're working directly against it and it's gotta to come to an end. Thank you. Don't feel like you have to speak for your I'd like to add to that that what the federal government can do is simplify our tax code and get out of the business of crony capitalism because we have too many uh, you know big uh, business owners in this, in this country who are feeding at the trough of government largesse 
and the government is picking winners and losers, and the government needs to get out of business of that. And, and I think that as a, an elected representative, that's what we should expect of our representatives, to really end that wasteful and unfair practice of crony capitalism in our country. Next question, next category. The category is winning. The question is, why should you win your party's primary? That is, why you instead of another candidate in your party? Also, why should you win over the opposing party candidate who wins their primary? Jeff Thompson. Thank you. Great question. Uh, first of all, I probably have more experience in the business world and certainly in healthcare than any of the other candidates. And that's what's crying right now and screaming for a need in Washington, D.C. We need people to go back there and get it done. I've got great ideas, you know. One problem, one thing we always hear is, what are you going to do? Nobody wants to work together. And the, the thing I came up with right away, I said, hey, do it just like the business world. They have to balance a budget. They don't operate on a balanced budget. Take 20% out of their pay next year. They do it two years in a row, we'll take another 20 out. If you go three years in a row, you're not eligible to run again. And we'll do it with the President of the United States, too. There has to be accountability to the American people. What was the second one? Why are you over the opposite party? Uh, we've the debated government. them twice. Well, not all of us. Travis, I think you and I have debated them twice. And let me tell you, I'm licking my chops to debate with the uh, three Democrats. Uh, we've heard their best shots. They're tax and spend Democrats. Uh, I'm not the least bit hesitant to go head to head with them. Why me? Um, I think that I'm uh, the, the only candidate up here who has um, very solid foreign policy and national security experience, which is very important. The number one obligation of the federal government is to care for our national security. And in the state of Arizona, we need someone who can stand up for, the, for our border and, and, and demand that our, our federal government secure our border. And these questions are, are very important at the federal level. And we need to have someone in the delegation who can lead that discussion for Arizona. Uh, in terms of the other, the other candidates uh, in the, on the Democrat side, I am exactly who they don't want to see because they have caricatured market conservatives and what they're hoping for is their caricature because they want to break us down and distract us from our argument. You put me up in front of them, a strong market conservative, they will have to actually speak to the issues and they'll lose rather than distract on some caricature that they've developed of, of conservatives. First question, could you, could you restate it? Certainly. Why should you win your party's primary? Second, second question is, why should you win the general? Okay, uh, why should I win the primary? Because I can win the general. I have the team that can win the general. I have the resources to win the general. You know, this is very serious business. Early ballots go out in two weeks. Two weeks. And look at the level that a lot of these campaigns are at, including on the Democrat side of the House. We have to nominate somebody who can hit the ground running on August 29th and win this general election. We have two months. And as far as why in the general, I'm a constitutional conservative Republican. I'm not married to toe the party line. I'm not married to the Republican Party. I don't feel obligated to go to Washington, D.C. and do what leadership tells me to do. I tell that to independents, and I tell it to Democrats. And because of that, a lot of them are saying, you know what, I may not agree with you ideologically, but I feel like I can talk to you. And for that reason, I might vote for you. And for me, that's enough. Thank you. Wendy Rodriguez. I don't do what's popular, I do what's right. When I enrolled in ROTC in 1972, what was happening? The drawdown of the Vietnam War. Was it popular to join ROTC and wear a uniform across campus in the Midwest? No. When I graduated in 1976, I was one of 18 in my class from a campus at Michigan State of 50,000 students. I was one of the first women pilots in the Air Force. I'm a leader, I'm a trailblazer, and I demonstrate it daily in my business. In a rocky real estate industry, we have succeeded, starting in our living room and building a business to what it is today. How will I beat the Democrat? Take a close look at the Federal Election Commission financial reporting figures from Sunday night. I have had more donors, to my campaign, and I have no debt in my campaign. I did not lend myself any money 
If I can't earn the money, then I don't deserve to run. Thank you. Thank you. We are fortunate to have an additional candidate. We're going to bring in Mark Zavala here after we are having a certain amount of data. on Navy time. Next round, uh, everybody gets the same question category is gun control. Question is, what is the importance of the word infringe in the Second Amendment? When you graduate. I can tell you the Second Amendment gives me the right to bear arms and it doesn't give the right of the government to restrict me from bearing arms. It doesn't say that I have to have a license. It says that I can bear arms. And I resent when a state narrows that down from a federal uh, amendment to make it more restrictive. So my answer would be that it is my right to bear arms and I will faithfully support and defend the Second Amendment as stringently as possible to con continue to have that right. Gun control, Second Amendment, Mark Zavala. Thank you. Yeah. No matter what the state constitution says, it does not trump the federal, uh, our, our constitution. Uh, I believe in the right to bear arms. There's no bones about it. Uh, I've spent uh, a lifetime uh, in the military, well, half a lifetime, I guess. And so it's something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, many of us have been overseas. You see that they don't have the right to bear arms. We see what those democracies look like. But we're a republic that believes in the right to bear arms. And I'll, I'll always defend that. Thank you. Would it cringe, Travis Grantham? It means that the federal government in this country has no business and no right to take away our rights to own guns. And they have no business to regulate what type of guns we choose to own. But furthermore, something that needs to be discussed today is what's going on on the national level with the UN and the proposed gun control. And I talked about treaties when the G8 summit was in Chicago. And you can go on my website at Grantham for Congress and you can see where I stand on those issues. This is serious business, and this is why this country needs to be out of the UN. If we're not very careful, we will have elected representatives in the House and in the Senate who will walk over that cliff and give away our Second Amendment rights to an international governing body. It's unacceptable. It actually makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'd just like to echo what, what Travis said. And, you know, the, the Second Amendment is the simplest and clearest uh, amendment in the Constitution. I don't think there's any, any debate about what it tells us. And Travis is right. When we have the UN uh, uh, attempting to uh, infringe upon our sovereignty, we need to have leaders in Washington who are going to stand up to that and, and put a stop to that. Infringe, Jeff Thompson. Well, infringe in that particular situation just simply means the government does not have that right. Uh, they try to step over and overstep their boundary on rights. But uh, the one thing about that treaty that you do have to understand uh, with the United Nations, for a treaty to be signed, it has to be signed by the President of the United States. It has to be approved by two-thirds of the Congress. It's not going to happen. I'm an NRA member. I stay up on this stuff pretty darn close. The big thing we need to really fear, again, we have to win the White House because there's probably going to be three members of the Supreme Court that are going to retire during the next presidency. And if Obama gets elected again, he is going to appoint liberals and they're going to come after that Second Amendment. They don't like it. And they'll try to restrict, they'll try to restrict what we can buy. You know, if you like an AR-15 or something, you're going to have a rough time buying that. They'll try to restrict weapons. And I remember, so uh, you know, I'm a strong Second Amendment advocate. Next category is health care. Quote, 
Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, close quote. What, if anything, can and should Congress do with regard to fortifying the First Amendment to the Constitution's guarantee of religious liberty as it applies to conscience exemptions in general and specifically to so-called Obamacare? Leah Campbell Chandelar. Congress should repeal Obamacare. I'm going to try to see if I can find another way to say that. <laughs> Completely strip the law from the Federal Register. Okay. <laughs> Jeff Thompson. Well, I think I started off with this at the beginning. Uh, repealing Obamacare is a no-brainer, but you have to focus on what's it going to take to get it to happen. You know, uh, Nancy Pelosi made a funny comment a couple weeks ago, and no one said caught it, but she talked about the people that don't own health care as being freeloaders. Mm. Let me tell you, I was in that business, and it, you should have the right in this country to decide that risk. If you want to take that risk on yourself, you're not a freeloader, because when you go to the doctor, when you go to the hospital, you pay. You're not freeloading anything. You're paying out of your own pocket, and you have a lot of risk. And if it doesn't work out, you could go bankrupt. Or if you want to put it with an insurance company in the private market, by the way, is what we have to do with portability, with tort reform, we can make health insurance more attractive. But if we don't get tort reform, the premium is going to keep going up like they have in the last 30 years. And when has the government ever made anything cost effective? They get a hold of Obamacare, and I will be great, I guarantee it, in a very short time. Conscience exemptions. Wendy Rogers. I met with some ophthalmologists today, and they told me that already we have lost our doctors. Half of U.S. doctors now have opted out of Medicare. Every U.S. doctor who has any foresight, has an egress plan. Well, that's what you and I call it. An exit strategy. <laughs> to go to some Central American or South American country where he or she will be uh, honored for his or her expertise and compensated accordingly. That's what they told us today. How sad is that? We have gutted our health care in this country because of government being in the way and, and being the decider for ourselves instead of we, the people. Health care liberty, Mark Zabola. So it's been said it does need to be repealed and it should be repealed. But we said from day one, if the Supreme Court uh, rules Obamacare not unconstitutional, it doesn't change this, we can't afford it. That's going to be clear to everybody on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so, uh, as far as the actual question with, your question was... Specifically was, with regard to, what should Congress do to guarantee their religious liberty as applied to conscience exemptions in general and specifically to so-called Obamacare? Right, well they need to uphold it. Certainly, we're going to repeal it at this point. I think uh, part and parcel of that though, the religious uh, institutions need to step up a lot louder than they are right now and demand that this happen. Uh, sort of that, uh, Medicaid needs to be pushed down, block grants at the state level, and quite frankly, what's happening in Texas, I think our governor's talking about it in Florida, uh, they need to demand that they, the states, have the Medicaid provision to provide. I think we start chipping away at this, this huge uh, uh, health care fiasco, Obamacare, and to show everybody it just doesn't work. But it will be repealed at some point in time, and uh, we need to be more vocal about the conscientious. Uh, thank you. Next category is federal government. The question is, should the Constitution be amended to include a balanced budget amendment? If so, what consideration should be included in that amendment? Martin Zapolio. Okay, so we need that balanced budget amendment. My priority from day one is this. Uh, find those like-minded like members of Congress and make sure we get a balanced budget amendment. A lot of people have talked about that. Republicans, Democrats, Independents. Find those people. That would be my number one priority and make it happen. There's, no other, there's no, no other way to do this other than saying this is where we're at. We don't have a lot more years of luxury to not have a balanced budget amendment. Again, it, it goes back to accountability. 
sort of the Republicans talk the good game, well, we need to continue to talk that good game. But it's not just a Republican issue, it's an American issue. So again, we have to live within our means. Uh, there has to be uh, a very big push for a balanced budget amendment, and I, that's, that's going to be my priority. Thank you. Balanced budget amendment, Leah Campbell, Shandemauer. Yes, absolutely. There should be a balanced uh, budget amendment. And I think that we need to, uh, you know, the, the value of that is that we'll move away from this idea that we can have all these unfunded uh, activities going on outside of, of the normal scope of government, and it'll force government to, uh, to act within its means, to spend within its means, and it will force Congress finally to make the necessary cuts across government because government has grown beyond the size and scope it was intended to be. Balanced budget amendment, Travis Grantham. Three words, cut, cap, balance. And I signed this pledge when it wasn't cool and when it was brand new and Senator Jim DeMint introduced it. We have to cut spending levels in this country. We have to. We have to cap spending somewhere close to incoming GDP as far as the federal government's cut of that GDP. And we have to add a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I mean, this is imperative. If we do not get the spending and the debt under control in this country, nothing else matters. I mean, we will go over that fiscal cliff, and our economy will cease to function. Our dollar won't be worth anything. So it's crucial that we sign a balanced budget amendment and attach it to the Constitution. Balanced budget and Jeff Thompson. If you heard me speak before, and I know a lot of you have, uh, one of the first things I always say is we don't have a tax problem in this country. Taxing treats the symptom to the problem. The problem is a spending problem. But there's no cuts. I'm sorry, the problem, yeah, it's a spending problem. There's no cuts. It's either print money, they printed 2.5 trillion since he's been in office or it's borrow money, or it's tax. No one wants to cut anything. The balanced budget amendment, you heard what I felt about it before, we have to put some teeth in it. We have to let the Congress know. Congress has failed miserably in this country. They've overspent on both sides of the aisle. And if, in fact, they can't balance the budget, they need to take a pay cut. Now, I'm going to tell you something. They won't balance the budget the first couple years. It's too deep of a hole right now. That's the realistic uh, understanding you have to have. But we've got to put the teeth in and say, we know you're not, but you're still going to get a pay cut for what you've done in the past. How do you like that? Welcome to the world of business. The American taxpayer should not be forced to continue to fund all this crazy spending. As I said, I need a payroll for 14 employees. If I can't make payroll, I've got a problem. I have to dip into savings, my meager military retirement pay. I run an office building. It'll be paid for in two years. We took ourselves out with a 10-year mortgage rather than a 30-year mortgage because I didn't want to be in debt until our 80s. It'll be paid for in two years. Every one of my seven vehicles has over 200,000 miles on it. We let our cleaning service go and we do our own carpet sweeping and toilet cleaning. Why can't government do that? Why can't government balance the budget? I have to. I have to take a sharp pencil every two weeks. We just changed our phone bill to five little residential accounts rather than a commercial account because we were being gouged as a business. What's wrong with that picture? Government needs to do what I have to do every day, and no one understands that more acutely than I do. Next category, entitlements. Social security is fundamentally a pyramid or so-called Ponzi scheme. The primary difference being that unlike private thieves, government can compel participation. What, if anything, can, should, and will you, as a member of the House of Representatives, do about it? Travis Grantham. The dreaded Social Security question. <laughs> Offer a private option. That's number one. You have to stop the ability for federal bureaucrats to be able to dip into the pot and spend the money on whatever they want to spend it on. There's no accountability in government, and because of it, 
There's no retribution when they take that money that's been paid in and spend it on whatever they see fit. That has to come to an end. I think we have to consider things in this country moving forward, not affecting the benefits of those that are currently receiving, but raising the retirement age in this country. That's a very realistic proposition. You have to allow people to opt out of Social Security. I would rather invest my money in a 401k. And if I'm a United States congressman, I'm going to ask that I'm allowed to invest in a private source of retirement. I think those are a couple of the, of the better ideas, and I could speak for 20 minutes on that one. Social Security, Jeff Thompson. Social Security is a defined benefit pension plan. It's, your benefit is based on how many years you work, how old you are, and how much money you made. It needs to be changed to a defined contribution plan where you put money in, you can have the market risk, and it can grow. But for the people above age 50, 55, we can't change it because they don't have time to go back and have a do-over. Therefore, the younger people are going to have some pain. And to fix this economy, there's going to be pain for all of us. Their pain's going to be the fact that the mortality tables constantly change and they live longer. They're going to have to wait longer to get their benefits. And like Travis said, for the young people, they need to have an option. And I'm not even sure it should be an option. We should probably just put them in a defined contribution plan and let it grow. And whatever it grows to based on their investment selection, that's what they're going to get at retirement. This country was founded on opportunity, not founded on entitlement. And that program kind of leans that way. Social Security, Wendy Rogers. I met with some attorneys a few weeks ago, and one of them said, if you privatize any part of Social Security, then what if the person does not manage his money well, and he ends up older and not cared for? Then isn't it the government's responsibility to take care of him? Oh my gosh, have we lost our way with that question. He was saying that it was the government's job to take care of us. He was saying that if we don't take individual responsibility for ourselves, then we can blame the government. I believe, as the Americans for Prosperity do, that with Social Security, we can do what the country of Chile has done. And they've privatized it at the beginning and intermediate age levels. And as a result, Chileans, who have a lower standard of living than we, have much more saved per capita than Americans. It can be done. Social Security, Martin Sepulveda. Thank you. Social Security, uh, first and foremost, uh, is a benefit to those receiving it right now. You paid in, and it's been misrepresented from all the stuff here by the Democrats that we're going to take away. That's not what I've heard. So it's a benefit to someone who's receiving that right now. Those that aren't receiving it, that's another, that's another conversation. When Social Security first was enacted, four workers for one receiving benefits, that was the pain. Right now it's three to one. Within 20 years, if nothing changes, it's going to be two to one. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's the wrong side of the pyramid we're, we're looking at here. So the big option here is privatization, okay? The other option is to grow the economy. There's a lot of smart plans out there, but nobody's talking about growing the economy. If we grow the economy and bring back some of those manufacturers offshore right now, guess what? More workers, more people to pay in, more options. There should probably still be a government option, but there has to be a 401k uh, type of a program as well as a thrift savings plan program to have the, for the privatized, uh, folks want to privatize, and guess what that does? It's a government option, it keeps the cost lower. So it's an important thing that we've got to look at. Social Security, Leah Campos, Shannon Well, Social Security is another example of the federal government trying to influence the behavior of every individual in this country. And I think that, you know, it, while it's true that we, uh, there was a promise that was made to people at or near retirement age and people who have paid into the system, the federal government has to come up with a way to phase out uh, the federal control of this program and to allow individuals the, uh, the opportunity to, to decide if they want to save for the retirement and how they want to go about doing that. And we have the cautionary tale of Europe, so we know that it's going to be painful either way. We may as well get this uh, under control and get Americans disavowed from the idea that government is going to constantly save them from themselves. Uh, now, because otherwise we're going to have burning cities like we saw in, in, in Athens, and that's a, that would be a, a tragedy in America. 
The next category, immigration. The three parts of SB 1070 ruled un unconstitutional are, one, make it a state crime for an immigrant not to be carrying papers, two, allow for warrantless arrest in some situations, and three, forbid an illegal immigrant from working in Arizona. Question, what, if anything, will you do in Congress about illegal entry of individuals into the United States? Leah Campbell Schandelbauer. Well, I think for starters, we need to demand that the federal government develop uh, a credible and serious way to secure this border. And Arizona's unique here. We don't have the topographical uh, barriers that uh, other border states have. And so we, we have the right and we have the obligation as a congressional delegation to demand real border security. In terms of, of people coming across uh, illegally, I think that uh, we need to figure out a way to uh, develop an immigrate, a modernized immigration policy that would uh, deter and mitigate the need for, or the, the, the draw for people to come across illegally. Um, I think through a combination of E-Verify programs and through guest worker programs where people who uh, require labor of some sort can, can, uh, can apply for it, they can come across for a while and then go back to their home countries. And I think that that would uh, lessen the demand for illegal labor in this country. Illegal immigration, Jeff Thompson. Well, I got a great story. That I can't tell, there's not enough time. But in the business world, you understand something early on. You get what you reward. And when you reward people to come into this country illegally, you're gonna get them. They're gonna find a way to get here, okay? They come into this country, we give them free education for their kids, we give them free welfare, we can give them housing, they can get tax returns even if they're undocumented illegals. You're gonna start rewarding those people for that. They're coming. Mexico is a third world country. One of the things that I've said is we have so many troops abroad and we need to bring as many of them home as we can because we can't afford them. And if those countries need our support, they need to pay for it, not the American taxpayers. We could reposition thousands of troops, hundreds of thousands along our border. We could set up, we could build some, uh, some military bases, and guess what? Those people would secure the border, number one, and number two, they'd spend their money in our country, especially Arizona, instead of abroad. And that would not only help with our economy, but it would secure the borders. I'm out of time. Illegal entry, Martin Zavaldo. Well, the fact of the matter is, there's no reason why we can't secure the borders. Uh, I've been to two combat theaters in Iraq and Afghanistan, First thing we did was secure the borders as best we could. Why? Because we have troops there. We can do that in the war zone. We can do it here. Bottom line is, uh, we've got to engage the government of Mexico. That's the source. Quit treating the symptoms and go to the source. The problem impacts them as well. Ill illegal, illegal immigration uh, come with a lot of nefarious characters. Human smuggling, drug guys. I mean, we had a bust uh, last week, uh, the Sinaloa drug cartel. They're alive and well, right down the street. That should be a national priority. Forget, in my opinion, these wars everywhere else, looking at the civil strife in other parts of the world. This impacts us right now. We've got to take it serious. Secure the borders, engage the government of Mexico at a federal level, because if they become a failed state, they're close to it right now, but if they become a failed state, we're all less safe, not more safe. Illegal entry, Wendy Rogers. We've allowed the left to frame this conversation as the pitiful family looking for a better life when in reality it is a national security nightmare, or could become one any moment. Notwithstanding the fact that, God forbid, a nuclear weapon come across this porous border, but every day, already what's happening is the Islamic jihadists are allying with Mexican drug cartels. And this is written about in the press and ignored. We absolutely have the technology and the manpower, but not the willingness to secure the border. I have visited uh, a technological firm that has forward-looking reconnaissance capability at a very cheap price to be able to interdict. It's there, but the will is not there. And as your congresswoman, that will be my number one priority, is to do everything I can to secure my country. Illegal immigration, Travis Grant. I'm, I'm a little disappointed because I'm hearing a lot of ideas that would happen behind desks in Washington. Why don't we build a fence? 
that stops the flow of illegal immigrants into this country? Why don't we put active duty soldiers and guard members on the border of this country, north and south, to stop the flow of illegal immigrants into this country? We secure borders all over the world. It was said very well. There is no reason and no excuse that we should not be securing our own at home. Thank you. The next round is a quick answer section. I expect that each candidate will be able to answer these very, very easy, usually yes or no questions in less than 10 seconds each. There are 17 questions. I'm going to ask each candidate the exact same question. Once again, the order will be randomized. We'll begin. Pro-life, pro-choice, Mark Zapolda. Pro-life. Pro-life, pro-choice, Travis Cranham. Pro-life. Jeff Thompson. Pro-life. Wendy Rogers. Pro-life, 100%. Leah Campbell Schandelbauer. 110%. Next question. For or against the DREAM Act? Jeff Thompson. Against. Martin Sepulveda. Against. Leah Campbell Schandelbauer. Against. Wendy Rogers. Against. Jeff Thompson. I already spoke against. Sorry. You can tell the story from me, go again now. Tactical weather on my randomizer. <laughs> Thank you. What would happen if somebody said four? Would we be able to finish the uh... <laughs> <laughs> against? Very good. Maybe these are too easy. We'll see. Is the job of the federal government to make anything affordable? Wendy Rogers. Negative. Martin? No. Leah? No. Jeff? No, but there's an asterisk there. It's here. Want to hear it? Well, if you look like if you look at the oil crisis that we're going through now, with the, the Strait of Hormuz is probably going to get shut down, and we should have been stockpiling oil a long time ago. So that is the responsibility of the federal government to make that affordable for us. But because of just ignorance on the part of our federal government, this gasoline price could go five, six bucks when this thing blows up over there, and we haven't done a thing to prepare for it. Travis? Yes, our tax returns. Taxes. I like it. Next question. Is homosexual unions a federal government issue, Martin? No. Leah? No. Jeff? No. Travis? No. Wendy? No. Boy, these questions are too easy. <laughs> Is it the federal government's job to incentivize anyone to do anything? If so, what? Leah. No. Jeff? Yes, to obey the laws. Martin? Oh, yeah, in the, in the military, absolutely. Go to work. Wendy? No. Travis? No. Next question. 11 aircraft carrier battle groups with an aircraft carrier at the center of each one that is larger than any other nation on any other nation has even one on honor. Too many, too few, just right. Jeff Thompson. I gotta have you repeat that again. I'm sorry, but here you go. United States has 11 aircraft carrier battle groups. There's an aircraft carrier at the center of each of those that is larger than the rest of the world combined has even one. Is that too many? Is that too few? Or is it just right? It's kind of a, the, uh, the Goldilocks and the <laughs> question. First of all, it's our responsibility to have a very strong defense. And we need to have whatever that number would be to make sure that we have a very strong defense. Um, I think it's 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 just right. No, we have we don't need to grow it anymore, though. Martin, eleven is a number where the uh, Navy has picked for quite some time. But the caveat I would have is this: they don't all need to be deployed at the same time. Again, it comes back to some. Thoughts. Perhaps they have different foreign policy, but 11, no, 11 is what they've settled on right now. Travis? You know, when, when you consider the global footprint America has between submarines and bases and the ability to put bombers in the air with tankers like I fly and to deliver armament anywhere in the world within about a 12 hour window, it's too many. Next question. Oh, sorry. Do I miss Wendy? Wendy, Wendy, thank you. The Air Force must have a say. 
It's never enough when push comes to shove. It's fine in peacetime. But when we don't have enough, it's too late. Keep in mind that this next question is should you get elected, will be held in two year answer. Are you committed to eliminating all exemptions from its own regulations and eliminating special benefits for all members of Congress? Wendy Rogers. Yes. Travis. Yes. Martin. Yes. Leo. Yes. Jeff. Absolutely, and I'm for term limits and doing away with their pension and making it a defined contribution plan, and they need to have Obamacare if they voted for it. <laughs> Next question. NASA, welfare, welfare for the highly educated or mankind's greatest hope? Travis. NASA. Wow, those are my only two choices. I don't think it's necessarily mankind's greatest hope, but I'm very disappointed that we've ended the shuttle program and we're not exploring further into space right now. Yeah. You know, it's a domino effect is the problem, and if we don't get the economy fixed to where we're growing and there's revenue coming in, great programs like this get axed. So we've got to fix the economy first, and we've got to get jobs created and get growth so we can have the luxury of doing these things because there's been so many great inventions that have come out of NASA. Leo. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with Jeff. There, we, we, we aren't in a position right now to do it. So maybe right now it's a wonderful private sector endeavor that should be undertaken. But it would be nice when we when we get grow our economy and are able to really invest um, in R and D in the in the space program. Martin. Yeah, sorry, Vince. So a lot of great things came out of the NASA program. Right now we can't afford it. That's the bottom line. Something we should reach for. Something we should encourage privatization and, and hopefully need some infrastructure there. But right now we can't afford it. And when we get back on a proper footing, we should really, that should be a priority once again. Wendy? I disagree. I think NASA embodies the dream that our country has. It embodies ingenuity. It incentivizes engineers and scientists to, to not sound too corny, reach for the stars. And when that kind of thing happens, then that has all boats will rise effect on the economy. We should not put the cart before the horse. We should invest in our brain power and look for things to strive for and not give up and let it all go to the economy because when that happens, the money just wastes. Next question. Is the practice of Sharia law or the application of Sharia law or the enforcement of Sharia law in the United States allowed under the U.S. Constitution? No. Absolutely not. Negative. No. Federal funding of embryonic stem cell research, yes or no? Martin. No. Wendy. No. Jeff. No. Travis. No. Leah. Absolutely not. Next question. Federal online sales tax, yes or no? Jeff Thompson? No. Martin? No. Travis? No. Wendy? Talk about a dampener. No. All right. Thank you. Leah? No. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Federal government building a fence along the border with Mexico, yes or no, Wendy? Yes. Martin? Yes, with an asterisk. We can't get like, wrapped around the asshole and just a fence. It's got to be a multi pronged technology approach. The fence is part of it. But that yes. should be on thing. Yes. Jeff. I think that if you continue to be a magnet, they're going to get over the fence. We've got to do more than just a fence. Leo. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. There are other technological means we can do, but I think policy. Real policy solutions can, can mitigate the flood. Do you support the practice of release time for U.S. federal employees, Leah? I'm sorry. Do you support the practice of release time? I don't even know what release time for federal employees is, and I'm a, I was a former federal employee. <laughs> Nancy, take a whack at it. Oh, oh, yeah, no, I, no, absolutely not. 
Travis. <coughs> Jeff. You know, I was a union member for a long time early in my life, but it's going a little bit too far on some of these things. So absolutely not. Martin? No. When? No. Right now we have federal food stamps. Should we? Yes or no? Martin? No. Leo? No. Travis? No, and bring it back to the state. <coughs> Jeff? You're saying do away with the SNAP program 100%? 100%. Do away with it 100%? Yes. I'm going to say don't do away with it 100%, but it's got to be changed drastically, and we've got to stop spending taxpayers' money to advertise it and double the number of people on it. It's ridiculous. I'm all for a safety net for people that need it, but it cannot be a hammock, and it is out of control. And if they don't want to fix it, then I say no, take it away. Wendy. No, and I agree, block grant the money to the states. Two questions left. Are so-called anchor babies U.S. citizens? Travis? Absolutely not. Jeff? No. Martin? Okay, if the baby was born in the United States, uh, clearly says born or naturalized in the United States. If that child is born in the United States by our Constitution, it's a U.S. citizen. Wendy? Definitionally, yes. That's yeah, question. Question. Well, I've heard about that because yeah. that's somewhat accurate. But can we okay, go ahead. It's my understanding that when the Constitution was written, and I'd be happy to be proven wrong, but it was not only implied but discussed that one of the parents had to be born and be a citizen of the United States. No, that's not true. That, that was my understanding. It's not true. It's true. Okay. What was that? It's not. Well, yeah, but sla the, the slavery excluded. Wasn't there discussions when the Constitution was drafted and when the 14th Amendment actually became law that it was not necessarily for, for parents who had a baby only who was born here? I thought they had to have one parent who was a U.S. citizen. Does this ring a bell? Right. Right. My point exactly. My, what I'm trying to say is the 14th Amendment's been hijacked, and I don't agree with it. The, yeah, from the amendment, the 14th Amendment clearly says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Hence my question. Last question. The Federal Reserve keep or replace Leah? Uh, first audit and pending what uh, comes out of that audit, uh, abolish it. Travis. Abolish it. Wendy. Keep it and audit it and make it accountable. Jeff. It has to be audited first so we know what they're doing before we can make a rational decision as to what to do with it. Martin. Federal Reserve is a private international bank. It needs to be audited and we're going to find out that it doesn't do as advertising. We should do away with it. Thank you all. That's the end of the quick answer section. We're going to move into a section where each candidate gets a different question. The total time for each candidate is a minute and a half. There, this section has one minute full of rebuttals. I will try to keep my eye on you guys, so catch my eye, please, if you want to rebut. We can have as many rebuttals as you want. Rebuttals are a minute. I'm going to keep loose track such that it is my hope that before somebody rebuts twice, everybody's had a shot at it, kind of thing. <coughs> we begin. The category is jobs and the economy. Is, quote, sending jobs overseas, close quote, real and a problem? If so, what can and should Congress do about it? Parts of all of it. Absolutely, it's a problem. Uh, again, to get out this dissolve and regrow the economy released a five-point job uh, creation plan a month ago. The first item there was we need more the uh, tax rate. We're not competitive. That's the bottom line. Uh, we're over-regulated as well. Um, so when jobs leave this country, especially when they're American uh, jobs and Americans still own them, that's not a good thing. So we need to adjust the corporate uh, tax rate. We're not competitive. And unless we change that, there, there's no incentive for the manufacturer in the United States. Uh, the regulatory environment, that's another problem. As far as the uh, middle class goes, uh, 
Two thirds of all net new jobs created in this country are created by small business who own small business, the middle class does. So again, we need to incent them to do more. And to do that, quite frankly, I think we can eliminate taxes on capital gains, interest, and dividends. What happens when you have extra money and you're a small business owner? You reinvest in your company. You hire more people, you buy more stuff. So uh, we absolutely need to attack the problem. We know what the answers are, we just gotta do it. And the first part of that, I believe, is lowering the corporate income tax. Seeing no rebuttal, we're gonna move on to the next question. The question is, also in the category of jobs and the, and the economy, what is the creation of wealth, and does government do it? Travis Grantham. The creation of wealth to me is allowing private citizens and people who own businesses to grow those businesses and actually succeed and keep the reward of that success in their pocket. The government does not do that. We, we talked about this briefly. The only thing the federal government can do is get out of the way and allow people with ideas and who create jobs to do what they do best. I see no rebuttals. Next question. Also jobs in the economy. How, if at all, is America exceptional? Jeff Thompson. Take a look around. I mean, here we are on a weeknight, and you people took time out of your schedule to come to an event like this. This is an exceptional country, and you people are to be commended, and I take my hat off to you. I speak to so many groups a week, and I tell them all the same thing. It's what makes America great when you look around and you see people like you that have come together trying to figure out what we need to do to get it straightened out. We've got problems in this country right now, and there's gonna be some pain to fix it, and I don't think I've gone anywhere and talked to people where they didn't say, guess what, we're willing to step up and take some of that pain, we know it. But if we don't go through some of that pain, this ship could sink, and we're all on it. And I think right now, and that's one of the reasons I got in this campaign, we need American exceptionalism. We need exceptional people to step forward. They always have in our past history, and lead us to the proper goals that we're all trying to achieve. And I encourage every one of you to get out there and mobilize and have constructive dialogue with people, not arguing, but constructive dialogue as to what we have to do in this country and what are the dangers of allowing this administration to go another four years. Even if we take the Senate back and this guy's in the White House, it's going to be very destructive to have Obamacare and to have Supreme Court justices appointed that are very liberal. So please, all of you, I encourage you, talk to people out there. And my red card's up. Next question, next category. And there is winning. The question is, the company that was tasked with setting up the redistricting maps in Arizona boasts that they have successfully gerrymandered for a particular party to win Congressional District 9. What do you think and why, Wendy Rogers? Do you think that this Congressional District 9 has been successfully ger gerrymandered for one party to win? Yes or no? And why, why do you hold that view? I cannot get into the minds of the Independent Redistricting Commission. I'm a pragmatist. I deal with what is in reality. The reality is it's roughly a third, a third, a third. I feel that I have transcendent characteristics of being the only job creator in the district and the only 20-year military retired Air Force pilot in the district running. What does that mean? Yes, it will be a tough fight. Uh, will I win? Maybe you're wondering. Why does she think she'll win? Because I have strong name ID in the arguably liberal bastion of Tempe and South Scottsdale because I bicycled to 10,000, now 11,000 doors. And I'm well known for being the sweaty lady on the bike. <laughs> How will I beat Kirsten Cinema? It is, it is my fondest dream in life. <laughs> No sharper contrast can be drawn between two women than between Kirsten Cinema and Wendy Rogers. And the only thing we have in common is that we're both women and we both have master's degree in social work. 
I'm a healthcare clinician from way back, three years in the military as a psychiatric social worker, and I am the only Republican social worker you will ever meet. <laughs> about America's future? If so, why? Leah Campos, Shandlebauer. Yes, I am very optimistic about our future because we are, by our very nature, an aspirational country. And I think that this election year is going, we're going to see Americans come together and agree that we need to defend America's free enterprise system, to defend the, the, the uh, aspirational nature of our country, and uh, celebrate the human dignity that comes from defining and earning one's success. And so absolutely, I think we are, I, I have every reason to be uh, optimistic and hopeful for this well, wonderful country of ours. Very good, seeing no rebuttal, we're going to go on to the next questions in the category of gun control. The question is, what can and will you do regarding the apparent federal abuse of power of the type that is fast and furious. Jeff Thompson. Wow. This is so suspicious. But you do have to understand that the President of the United States is well within his power to do what he's done. And Republicans have done the same thing that he's done. It is so important we get this guy out of office. I'm telling you, this is such a suspicious time with Eric Holder as the Attorney General and Barack Obama behind it and these poor people in Arizona who lost their son and so many people have been killed on the south side of the border also and these people cover up everything. They want to know if Mitt Romney signed an SEC form uh, when he was helping with the Olympic Committee and they're adamant about that and they won't allow the release of the information with all of these firearms that they sent down there, and I know it's for the, I believe in my heart, it's for the sole purpose it was to influence the Second Amendment and gun control. I believe that with my whole heart. You can call it a conspiracy theory if you want. I believe it. I think that's what they did. He was off the teleprompter the other day, and you heard what he said off the teleprompter. This is a socialist running our country, and too many of them have infiltrated these top positions. And I'm telling you, we have to send the right people back there. If you've heard me speak, you know the type of person I am. I can draw the line in the sand. And I can make the tough decisions that have to be made. And I know how to have the productive dialogue with the people on the other side to get things done. This is a very, very critical election. Next question. Next category. Leah, rebuttal, please. I just want to add to that that I had the privilege of being briefed on uh, Fast and Furious and the intelligence leaks by Congressman Trey Gowdy, who Representative Issa designated his, as his point man on this issue. And what he said to me when we spoke about both the intelligence leaks and Fast and Furious is, Washington needs you. We need a voice, someone like you, who can speak to these issues from professional experience. And um, I'm happy to say that two days ago he uh, has endorsed me. So I just wanted to add that. Martin, please, rebuttal. And so, not much rebuttal, I think we're all like-minded. We've got to make sure that Chairman Issa keeps, stays the course, keeps the pace, because what's going to happen here, there are impeachable offenses. I don't care who those people are. That committee has done a great job. You need to continue driving on. You need to encourage them to do that, because there are impeachable offenses. Very good. Next category, next question. Health care is the category. What if anything is wrong with so-called Obamacare? To what degree should the federal government be involved in national health care? Martin Zabola. Okay, so the Supreme Court said it's not unconstitutional, we still can't afford it. Okay, that's, that's the plain uh, truth. As far as uh, Medicaid, a component of that, the, the states need to demand that money gets block ran down to them. So that takes at least a third of it away. Well, probably more than that. Uh, so, the federal government's got no business telling us what we should or shouldn't do with health care. The majority of the Supreme Court will find differently. So it, now it's up to those members of Congress to, to continue on this fight. It's a budget issue. It's still ill-defined. It started from $800 billion, now it's $1.7 growing. We can't afford it. It's still ill-defined. Again, someone said up here, 
uh, probably not even half-hearted that those people voted for it should be those Congress, uh, members of Congress vote for it. They should be able to, to, to use it. And, and that's what we hope they would do. They won't, though. Uh, but we have to insist that two things happen. Continue to look at this program that's ill-fated, we can't afford, and it continues to redefine itself. So, uh, in light of the Supreme Court chime in and say it, it is not uh, constitutional, I think legislatively we need to continue banging away at this thing because we cannot afford it. And we all know in our hearts that the government, whether it's the federal government, the state government, does not belong in our lives. Same category, healthcare, next question. Oh, please, Jeff. It does not address the most important factor in health care, and that's tort reform. It doesn't address it. I've been in that business for 30 years, and I'm going to tell you something. The price has gone up consistently, and it's what made Obamacare a magnet for a lot of people because they were sick and tired of seeing the rates go up every year and seeing their coverages cut. Congress should have done something a long time ago about this, and the free enterprise system should have done something a long time ago about this. It can be fixed, but it has to have things addressed. But folks, if we don't get him out of the White House, we got it. Same category, next question. Healthcare is the category. In the recent U.S. Supreme Court majority opinion on the so-called Obamacare, Chief Justice John Roberts now famously said, quote, it is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices, close quote. Question, what limits our political choices? What, if anything, can and will you do in Congress to protect the people regarding socialized medicine. Leah Campbell Shandlebauer. Well, I want to I want to add to what he said about tort reform. I think tort reform needs to be uh, handled at the at the state level. Um, but in, in terms of uh, entitlements, we we have this, as I've said before, this cautionary tale in Europe of people believing that federal government can save them from themselves. And while we have these promises that the government has made to people, we need to begin the a difficult conversation of disavowing citizens of the notion that the federal government can save them from themselves and can provide these things. And we need to start uh, being much more federal, uh, much more uh, embraced on a much more uh, uh, serious level federalism and allow states to, to handle these issues and not try to do it at the, at the national level. Next question, different category. The category is federal government. The question is, what, if anything, is or are the differences between accomplishing something via government versus accomplishing that same thing via business in the free market? Wendy Rogers. It's fundamental. We can't have the country that we have without capitalism, without the free market, without competition. I want competition in education. I want competition in health care. I want competition in commerce. I want competition everywhere. Less government, less government, less government. I've lived half my military career overseas. I've flown to many, many third world countries. And I can tell you that there is nothing like the United States of America still. We haven't lost it yet. And all boats rise when competition is injected into whatever, education, health care, or whatever. I want government out of the way so that ingenuity and competition can come to fruition. Same category, federal government, next question. Under what circumstances, if any, should we pay off the national debt when and how I think we have to pay it off in the next five years or so or we're done. I mean, we're going to reach a point here very shortly where we cannot make the payments on the interest on the national debt. How? Uh, cap and balance pledge talks a little bit about this. Stop the bureaucrats from spending our money. Now, I'm a champion of ending something called baseline budgeting in the federal government. That's the use it or lose it principle. And any of you who have worked with government or in government know what happens at about the September 15th benchmark to all the money that's in the bank account. It gets spent on flat screen TVs, or it gets dumped overboard on the ship in, in fuel, or it gets spent in the air by pilots flying jets around for no good reason. 
because if they don't spend it, they don't get it back next year. That practice has to stop. We have to start rewarding those who are stewards of our tax dollars for good behavior and start punishing those who fraudulently abuse the system, just like they would be in the private sector. So you have to cut waste, you have to go in and change the entire dynamic and the structure of our system and the way it operates. That's how you pay down the debt. Same category, federal rebuttal, please. Please. Can I have a rebuttal, please? Yes, yes please. The national debt is about to go over $16 trillion. There's no way it will be paid off in three years. Even five years, it won't happen. I mean, Paul Ryan's budget calls for the balanced budget in 25 years. Uh, Rand Paul has an aggressive one. His balanced budget is in five years. That's just balancing the budget. That's taken away the $1.3 trillion budget deficit, not the national debt. You know I'm a cutter. You've heard me talk about it, and I'm with you, Travis. We have got to cut, but it's not realistic to cut this thing in five years. It's just not going to happen. But we have to stop the crazy spending, and we have to work towards it. But five years, it won't happen, folks. Mark? Quick rebuttal as well. Certainly in five years, it's not going to happen. Sixty trillion dollars, it's not going to happen. But I think across the board, so I, I would propose it would be 10, 12 years. I think uh, uh, Congressman Ryan's a very smart man, but 25 years, I'm not sure that's, I think that's too long. But look at all the agencies across the board, some will get cut, okay? But right now, let's just cut personnel and spending by 10 or 15%. That's a message. There are some agencies right now, the EPA is a great one, Depart uh, Department of Education is another great one. Push down the state levels, there's savings there. The other thing is this, I've spent the last 10 years going over the world in the military. I'm telling you, to look at more wars, that they're ill-defined wars, they're civil wars, that's the wrong thing to do. Right now, Afghanistan's costing us $100 billion a month, or trillion, $100 million a month. That's a lot of money. Okay, so that's just what we're paying. That doesn't uh, talk to those injured and uh, military members who are gonna be uh, on health care for life as it should be. But again, the military, we're spending too much money. I'm not saying the sequestration has to go through with the next trillion, but we need to look at that as well. Same category, federal government, next question. To what degree, if any, should the federal government be involved in educating the young Wendy Rogers? I was in a room with Condoleezza Rice just, uh, what, three weeks ago. And I asked the same question. We are in a global marketplace. And a fifth grader in Alabama should meet the same math standard as a fifth grader in Arizona. That might be an appropriate input by the federal government. But the implementation and the uh, enactment of making that happen and the enforcement belongs at the local level. I homeschooled my children through sixth grade after living overseas and our son being in a German school where the future of the child is decided at the end of fourth grade. After sixth grade, our children went to a charter school, Tempe Prep Academy, a flagship wonderful school. And after that, they both attended the Barrett Honors Program at Arizona State and both graduated successfully. So I've seen the entire spectrum. But what Condoleezza Rice underscored was, again, competition. There is no competition in the K-12 through system to speak of, except more in our state with charter education and distance learning. What we need to do is have competition in education so that we can compete in the global marketplace. Next question, new category. Category is entitlements. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are routinely called the third rail of politics. What can, should, and will you do about these three horses of the apocalypse that drive this nation's debt? Martin Sepulveda. Again, uh, Medicaid needs to be pushed down to state levels. Uh, Medicare, those that are on Social Security, those that are on, they have to stay on it. That's a benefit, an entitlement. Uh, those people 55 or 50 and below, that's an honest conversation. Thrift savings plans, 401k, the government will probably have a program as well, but let's compete. Let's have the private sector compete against what the government puts out there, but we have to have it. Uh, bottom line is when there's competition, but also we all know it, prices go down, not up. 
Uh, but again, it, it all boils down to an honest conversation we have to have with those people not currently on those uh, entitlements. Again, what we've said from day one, uh, you've got to grow the economy. There's no two ways about that. I go back to when Social Security started. Four people were put in for one that was taken out. Now it's three to one. If we do nothing, it'll be two to one. That doesn't work. But let's grow the economy. That's the way we need to grow our way out of this thing. There's not enough capacity to cut tax or raise taxes, so let's grow our way out. But again, honest conversation with Social Security, uh, Medicare, uh, it's got to be with those who are not receiving benefits right now. Let's figure out private sector alternatives that are out there, be market driven, free market solutions to compete with whatever lame program the government has. They'll keep the price down, and it's, it's a solution in the, in the short term. Next question, same category entitlements. In this morning's national news, there was a story that said, in the last three months, more than 240,000 Americans have joined the ranks of Social Security federal disability. Just under a quarter million people in three months. In the last three years in total, more than one million people have been added to this federal disability program. The rate of people leaving, or the, the chances of people leaving that disability program historically in their lifetimes is less than 1%. What concrete measures, if any, can and should be taken to end this exploding cost for the U.S. taxpayer, Leah campbell Shandelbauer? Well, you know, as you, as you uh, aptly stated it, it's called the third rail of American politics because it, it well, because it just is, and nobody wants to talk about it. And I, but I think that when there are uh, challenges as we face them right now, then we're going to have to elect strong people who are willing to risk uh, the the future of their political careers to speak the truth about these issues. And I think that we need to ask the hard questions about the constitutionality of these issues as well. And um, so I think that you know, short of short of you know the government um, canceling these problem these these programs entirely, which can't happen, we have to have an honest discussion about the direction we're going to go once people who are. Uh, uh, for the people below uh, and not at retirement age so that we can get a handle of this because it's an unsustainable program and, pro and probably in the minds of many Americans and probably many of you here unconstitutional. Right, please. Uh, but specifically on disability, there's a lot of fraud there. There's got to be teeth put in the law right now when someone gets off the roll, so to speak, and collects uh, disability and they, they, they leave the state, go to another state, and guess what, they're working again. That's fraud. There's got to be some, some hardcore uh, teeth put in those measures. So someone, someone who does that, guess what? They don't have to pay it back. They get to go to jail. And those employers, perhaps, didn't do a, uh, the employer shouldn't be uh, the ones either. I mean, they're taking money from the system fraudulently, and until there's any teeth in a, in a law, I'm not, I'm not advocating for a bunch more laws, but until there's any penalty, any consequence, it's going to go on. But unless we insist on that, shame on us. Can I say everything real quick? Yeah, please. Just, I'll make this real quick. And this is intended for you when you're having dialogue with people. People that are independent, people that are left. Look, of every dollar that comes into Washington, D.C., 40 cents of it goes to the national debt. What's left of that dollar, the 60 cents, isn't enough to pay for what we just talked about. That leaves the entire cost of the government behind. That's the depth of our problem. Do you want to put this guy back in the White House? Do you want to put some more tax and spend Democrats, like we're going to run against in the general, in, the, in the Washington, D.C.? Because it's not sustainable. People understand that. I've got... I've got six Democrats with signs in my yards and, and all kinds of independents. They get it. We've got to talk to them here, here. and tell them just what I said. Thank you. Next question, different category, immigration. To what degree should the laws of the United States affect federal immigration enforcement? And should the cost to U.S. citizens of legal immigration affect upholding immigration law? Travis Grantham. I'm going to answer the second part first. I think it should absolutely affect immigration law because right now we're hemorrhaging cash in this country that we don't have to deal with a lot of the illegals who are in this country who got here because our border is open. 
You know, and, and I think the decision's been made that the federal government gets to dictate immigration law, right? And quite honestly, the Supreme Court ruled that the, that the federal government is going to maintain our secure border. Well, then let's start holding them accountable and actually force them to secure that border. In regards to the financial aspect of it, we have to do everything humanly possible to stop the flow of illegal immigrants. We should instantly deport anybody in this country with a criminal record who is in one of our prisons. That would cut costs drastically when it comes to what we are spending on illegal immigrants in this country. Can I add something real quick? Please, please, John. It is such, this is my business mentality, and it's so different than Washington, D.C. It is so dangerous to reward bad behavior and to punish good behavior. We reward these people to come into this country, and we punish all of you with the price tag of paying for it. My wife's a retired teacher. If you didn't like 1070, well, they closed three schools in Tempe this year and three in Mesa because enrollment's down that far from the people that left this state for the fear of what was going to happen with 1070. We spend $12 billion a year on the education of illegals. We spend $90 billion a year on welfare for illegals in this country. And you guys pay for it. It makes your blood boil, doesn't it? And those people we have in Washington, D.C., we need to give them a gastric bypass on their spending of your tax dollars. <laughs> Next question, different category. You have to raise the environment. The question is, what is the responsibility, if at all, and on what grounds, of the federal government to take action for the purposes of affecting the environment? Jeff Thompson. I think someone said before the EPA needs to be moved to the state level. I think, Mark, you said that, and I agree with that. You've heard me say that in the past. Um, the EPA is not all bad. They've done good things. They have provided protection. But they're so manipulative, and their regulations are too tight on too, too many business owners. I talked to several business owners in the last couple weeks, and they both said, boy, the EPA just can, they can completely stop our commerce. We've got to think this stuff out a little bit more clearly. And, and again, I blame our politicians. They're the ones that have put this thing through. The EPA is way too strong. It's way too powerful. There's way too many regulations. It needs to be back at the state level. But everything in the EPA is not bad. There are some good things that they've done. Mark? Yeah, in the EPA, uh, again, the real strict standards. When you look at the manufacturing of gun offshore, guess what? High corporate taxes, high regulatory environment. The EPA uh, should have should not have the power it has right now. Uh, again, we lessen the, the burden with the tax. We lessen the burden on the regulatory environment. People come back. Manufacturers come back. Jobs are created. Again, I think the best place for the EPA for any environmental decisions. We have baseline decisions already. Clean Air uh, Act, Clean Water Act. Those shouldn't change. But those baseline decisions, or the decisions below the baseline decisions, should be at the state level. Because it's the states, not the federal government, that are going to be interacting with its manufacturers from back to this state or any other state to create those jobs and, and uh, uh, actually repatriate from, from uh, overseas. Thank you. Going into the final round before closing remarks, Wendy, please. Guess what the number one complaint that farmers have? It's against the EPA for dust. The number one complaint. And why? Because farmers try to do what's right, but no matter what way to Tuesday they try, the EPA clamps down on them harder and harder for dust. These are dairymen, these are hay balers, these are grape pickers, everybody in the agricultural community. You would never think of that. But that is what is hurting them. Yes, and the child labor farce as well. Question different category, categories foreign affairs. To what degree do you support defunding the United Nations? <laughs> we should defund it last week. Uh, absolutely, it needs to be defunded. There's nothing that the United Nations has done uh, that I can think of even before that, so it's done something good. Uh, I was in Kosovo in 1999 to 2000, and we were there because the United Nations had failed. Uh, There's a lot of tragedies that they were supposed to be uh, there to stop. Sherpa needs when it comes to mind. It didn't happen. 
So NATO kicked in, and NATO did, uh, I think, a credible job. But the bottom line is this. United Nations, they're failed. We're spending way too much money on them, uh, on, on maintaining them in the United States. I don't think they belong here. They're not friends. When you have uh, high committees in the United Nations that talk about human rights uh, committees, and you have uh, Iranian uh, ambassador, whoever his title is, on that committee, it doesn't work. It's, it's making a mockery of what we believe in. And I believe not only should we defund them, we should ask them to leave and go somewhere else. I, I just want to add, um, just, I, I subscribe to the, the realist school of thought when it comes to our foreign policy. I think we should have uh, entanglements with nobody, commerce with everybody. There are so many international organizations that we continue to be involved in that are anachronistic, they are Cold War constructs, and they constrain us. We should be able to act uh, uh, unilaterally, if there's another country with whom we feel we want to uh, act uh, with or react to a situation with, we should reserve that right. That's a unilateral decision that we need to make, and we should not be beholden to any international organizations to make those decisions. Wendy? I would caution you in one area. Uh, as someone who was deployed for six months to uh, run the Bosnian airlift in 1994, I can tell you that the United Nations does do one thing helpfully, and that is refugee assistance. The United Nations High Commission for Refugee, UNHCR, was an organization that I worked with closely. They do a good job at that. However, I would never have a change of operational control for combat and ever condone having U.S. forces uh, wearing uh, the blue beret uh, under operational control by the United Nations. Another organization that people don't realize is a good thing is the International Civil Aviation Organization based in Geneva. That, again, is an offshoot of the United Nations, which is an aviation organization that is globally uh, a standard bearer. So there are good things that the United Nations does. Thank you. Next question, the same category, foreign affairs, please. I would, this will be real quick. And I agree with what you said, but it should not be funded with tax dollars. It can be funded with private dollars. It can be funded with charity. I think there's a lot of people that uh, have the same thought process and be willing to donate money to charity, especially if we can reduce taxes and get this country back on its feet, there'll, there'll be more money for that, not taxpayers' dollars. Same category, next question. What, if anything, should be special about the treatment of Israel by the United States government? If so, what and why? Leah Campbell Shandelauer. What, if anything, should be special about the treatment of Israel by the United States government? If so, what and why? Well, I think that um, you know, Israel, the, Israel's our ally in the, in the region, and right now we see a rise in Islamism around the world, and that is a, a national security priority for us. And I think that we need to be uh, partners with Israel on uh, combating Islamism. And, uh, and But yet, I, 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 I want to maintain that I believe that these should be unilateral decisions we make, and they should benefit our national interests primarily. And so as, as, so far as we have something in common and the national security interest in common with Israel or any other country, we should act with them and be good allies with them. Um, but I do think that we need to make the rise of Islamism a, a priority in our country because it is a very serious threat and has only gotten worse since the election of Barack Obama. Mark. There's no doubt the United States will stand by Israel uh, economically, militarily, uh, but the one cost I've always had is this. Israel decides to go to war. Okay, that's Israel's decision. They don't need our, our, our Congress or our president to say yes or no to that. Uh, I don't believe that it's in our best interest for a preemptive strike on behalf of Israel and anybody else. If there's going to be any talk of war that, that, that starts with the Israelis, and they're our allies, and we should have a very clear, very public discussion in the Congress of the United States and then invoke the War Powers Act. We've been at war for way too long, it's ill-defined. Again, back to Israel, there's a lot of talk about what's happening in Iran and, and the bad things that could happen, but at the end of the day, we have a constitution. Our Constitution doesn't allow us to do preemptive strikes on somebody else's behalf. We've got to stop talking about wars like they're a casual affair. 
Israel's our ally. They choose to go to war, and we choose to back them up. We need to have a very, very public discussion and, and a declaration of war. Very good. Same General of Foreign Affairs. Next question. Should the U.S. provide any direct foreign aid to any country under any circumstances? If so, by what authority, for what purpose, and for how long? Jeff Thompson. Well, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me talk about this a lot. We give $26 billion a year in foreign aid. And if it's on my website, too, I've said it for a long time now. We need to have at least a two-year sabbatical where we don't give foreign aid to anyone. That's your tax dollars. I have no confidence that money's ending up in the right hands. I mean, Egypt, we just gave them $1.2 billion. Uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton offered another $2 billion if they'd let the doctor go that uh, we turned over to them. Uh, Pakistan, $2 billion. Pakistan sells our stealth technology to China when the helicopter crashed. We should not give this foreign aid to anyone, I don't think, at this point, because the number one reason, we cannot afford it. It's not affordable, it's not sustainable. If we want to do what Travis said earlier, and that's cut this debt, we have got to make tough cuts, and we cannot give the taxpayers money to these countries overseas, and the one countries that require our presence need to pay for it. They should pay for the security of having our troops there, not the American taxpayers. Next question, new category. The category is U.S. House of Representatives. An ASU professor attributes Ronald Reagan's economic success to his consulting, listening to, and acting on the recommendations of a professional economist. Who, that is what kind of people, will you assemble in your staff and why? Travis Grantham. You know, I would look to assemble the same type of people that support me as a candidate. Doug Fulton, Ira Fulton, Ron Fulton Holmes, they're hurt right now. They create jobs. The CEO of AmeriCo, the parent company U-Haul in this town. Lots of business owners, NAFA, the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors has endorsed me. These are industries that are under direct attack by regulations that are being put forth by an out of control federal government. Unconstitutional regulations. And I always say quality, not quantity. That's how I do business, it's how I've lived my life. And I would be happy to surround myself by people much smarter than I, because that's what this is about. When you're a representative of the Republic, we are supposed to take your opinions and your ideas and your concerns to Washington, D.C. and debate them on your behalf at the national level. And there's a lot of people in this audience and in this economy that know much more than every single one of us up on this stage tonight. So I would pride myself by surrounding myself by people who understood what needed to be done to turn this country around. Thank you. This last question of this round could be a yes or no question answer. Same category, U.S. House of Representatives. Has Congress abdicated its responsibility and authority to the President of the United States? If so, how? Wendy Rogers. Yes, in the declaring of war. That was easy. <coughs> Very good. That ends that section. Before we go into fine, or into candidate closing remarks, I have final questions. One very quick round and two rhetorical. The very quick round one, I'll just go through your names after answering the question, if you can answer this. Are you, you committed to openly supporting the winner of the primary of your party? Leah? Absolutely. Jeff? Yes. Martin? Yes. Wendy? Affirmative. Travis? Yes. Very good. These next two questions are strictly rhetorical. Because any society that has no limits to its tolerating the loss of liberty is destined to enslavement, consider the following two rhetorical questions. As an elected leader of the people of this state, question number one, at what point, if any, would you call for succession from the union? Question number two, at what point, if any, would you call for taking arms into the streets? On those very sober notes, we're going to go into the candidates' closing remarks. They'll have one and a half minutes each. Closing remarks, beginning with Jeff Thompson. Well, I appreciate everybody coming here tonight. Am I might answer those questions first. 
No, they are rhetorical. You, you can answer if you want, if you like, but you don't have to. You know, as a 31-year resident of Ottawa, <coughs> this is a special place to me. Uh, when I moved here, I don't think there was anything south of Warner Road, but the desert. We used to ride our dirt bikes out there. Taught my kids to do that. Uh, you're all very important to me, or I wouldn't be doing this. You know, I came out of my comfort zone to run in this race. Uh, and I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about America. I'm passionate about our congressional district in Arizona. And I'm passionate about Ahwatukee. And I think it takes a special person right now to go back there and do what needs to be done. Uh, I've got the utmost respect for the military duty that these people sacrificed and gave up here. Don't get me wrong. My dad was World War II and I had five or six of my good friends killed in Vietnam. So it means a lot to me what they've done. But I think right now it's very clear that we have to send someone back to Washington, D.C. that A is not a politician, is not an attorney, understands the business environment, and has ideas. The one thing you hear from me that sometimes you don't hear from a lot of other people is I've got ideas. I'm an idea guy. I have been my entire career. It's what's made me successful. I've been able to come up with solutions that other people have not, and I've been able to implement them. The problem we have in Washington, D.C. is what Ronald Reagan said. If it moves, we tax it. If it keeps moving, we regulate it. And if it stops moving, we subsidize it. And that's the problem back there. We need to have somebody that's a strong personality that really understands how to bring sides together and negotiate and has had a lot of years of success doing it to go back to Washington, D.C. and represent you. If you vote for me, you've got my promise. You won't be disappointed. Closing remarks, Leah Campbell Shandlebauer. Thank you. Um, you know, Mr. Thompson often um, alludes to the fact that he's not a politician and often says that the rest of us are politicians. I would submit to you that since we're all running for uh, a political office, we are now all politicians. Even if this is my first time running, we're now politicians. And what we should endeavor to do is to once again bring back the uh, noble attributes of the politician. And uh, I can tell you that if I'm elected to be your congresswoman, I will go uh, to Washington as a principled leader, as uh, someone who will stand uh, with the delegation of Arizona for us to be the conservative compass in Congress. And in order to do that, you have to have people who are able to deal with other people, who have uh, a level of diplomacy, who have a, a very good understanding of the world around us, and who are willing and able to help lead people to the right decisions. And I would submit to you that I'm that person. In addition to that, we, uh, we're confronting a very uh, difficult general election. And whoever we select, has to be able to, to win in this district that has not been created for any of us. It was, it's, it was created for an independent and it was, and it was uh, gerrymandered, as was discussed earlier, to benefit the Democrats. And so we needed to elect somebody that can steal away the failed narrative of the left, the narrative that they have about us, someone who won't allow them to uh, caricature us, and who can force them to speak to the issues uh, without any of these other distractions that they will surely throw at any of the others that are up here. Thank you. Closing remarks, Martin Sabalo. Thank you, and thanks for having us this evening. Um, as Lake said, a lot of dental surgery done, so I couldn't, didn't know I was going to be able to talk. So, um, the, uh, you know, I was born and raised here. Uh, I have spent most of my time uh, in the military. Uh, I actually joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. I'm now 52. I'm a commander of the Navy Reserves. As a reserve officer, I've been deployed six different times. Okay, so uh, it's given me a different uh, view of the world. Uh, I'm also a small business owner. I've been almost 25 years of experience in the public and private sector. And what we all have said, what we all know is the government doesn't create jobs. I know that. I've been elected twice, two non-consecutive terms to the Chamber City Council. Quite frankly, I view both those terms as a tour of duty. But the one thing that we did there is we engaged the private sector. We, the public sector, the elected officials, we engaged those job creators in good things happening. We got out of the way. Uh, this election is about the economy. All of us here, our family, our friends, our neighbors, how we come together as Americans, get past this grip we're in. We need to have a, we need to have a way forward. Again, uh, with my experience in the public sector, the private sector, as an elected official, being born and raised here, I know what it's like to leave. I haven't been overseas. 
and seen some of the terrible places we've been, whether it's Bosnia, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Afghanistan, I know how precious our liberty is. I know what we're fighting for. I know how to lead. And certainly, I've got the experience I'm ready to serve now. I appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you. Closing remarks. Wendy Rogers. 22 years ago, I was flying Lear 35 C-21s in the United States Air Force overseas in Europe. I was pregnant. You could fly up to 24 weeks pregnant. So I had this smock uniform with my wings and my jump badge. And I was in my C-21 and the steps were down and this four-star general came on board. He was a pretty religiously devout fellow. And he looked at me, and the look of shock and awe on this general's face that his pilot was pregnant was indescribable. <laughs> he looked at me, and it just didn't compute. How can this woman be flying me in dicey weather in Europe and be pregnant? And I looked at him, and I said, sir, it's going to be OK. Just keep your feet off the furniture. <laughs> I give you that illustration because Marty Sepulveda and I had a conversation on the phone the other day. He says, Wendy, you got to tell that story. Where else but in America can a woman like me do all those things? Where she can defend her country, where she can have a small business, where she can raise two kids with her husband of 34 years and come back here and run for office in her district where she's rooted, I think it's an honor. I think it's a privilege. And no one will work harder for you than I will. My website is wendyrogers.org, and I am absolutely committed to serving you in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Closing remarks, Travis Grant. I've got a tremendous amount of respect for everybody up here. It's the ideas that we're listening to that we all need to, to digest and we need to make our decision based upon. And then I got a great amount of respect for Wendy's aviation heritage in, in the military. And I'm going to do something tonight that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And since she made it such a, a big part of her closing statement, I have to remind Wendy that nobody <clears throat> kicks ass without tanker gas. <laughs> 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 Very true. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it, it was an honor and a pleasure to be here. The Awatuki Tea Party is a great organization. We had a great forum last time. And, and I was proud to walk away victorious in the straw poll. You know, we have to nominate somebody in this district who can hit the ground running and defeat the Democrats. The Marxist collectivist Democrats that are running to hold this seat. This was not drawn, in my opinion, for a Democrat. This district was drawn for an American. And it was drawn for somebody who will take their ideas and the ideas of the people to Washington, D.C., whether they're Democrats or Independents or Republicans. I can tell you I'm that guy. I'd be happy to serve you in Washington, D.C. If you'd like to support our campaign, please go online, grantthemforcongress.com. We have a table set up in the back. And regardless of the outcome, early ballots go out in two weeks. I will help any one of these candidates beat that Democrat machine that's coming post-August 28th. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And keep voting members. One, things. one please fill out your stronghold balance. First party says who gave the best answers tonight. That's right in second part. If the election were out tonight, who do you vote for? We have to vote right in potentially three other people in here whose names aren't on. That includes Kirsten Sinema, Andre Cherney, or David Shapiro. Please vote now. The other thing is, it is my sincere hope that you came and you got what you were looking for, and that is substance. And finally, in the end of this evening, please join me in a heartfelt and most appreciative round of applause for our most excellent candidates.